everybody. I'm Sherry Birchall, the marketing manager of the Graduate School of Business. For those of you who don't know me, I see there are a number of faces I do not recognize. And we'd like to welcome you to the Graduate School of Business. Um, I do offer apologies on behalf of our director, Walter Bart. He's doing what good directors should do and attending a conference with the African Association of Business Schools in Lagos. So he does apologize. He really did want to be here for this. It's my pleasure to welcome you, and in particular, I'd like to welcome on behalf of the Graduate School of Business and the Zars, who are our very welcome and happy partners, I hope, in the speaker programs. Also welcome. And then also to you, Archbishop Stephen Bislin, Catholic Arch Archbishop of Cape Town. Welcome, sir. And then to Pro Professor Lamar Reich from Cape <coughs> University. Welcome. We're very pleased to have you here as well. I'd like to introduce you to Raymond, sorry Raymond, I've got the glasses on to make sure I pronounce things correctly. They all get dead and wrong. <laughs> Raymond Perry, director of the Jesuit Institute of South Africa, who will um, introduce Professor Algini to you all. conscious that Jesuit institutions have been rather in the uh, newspapers in Cape Town recently uh, because of a distinguished speaker from this city who has gone to a Jesuit institution in the States. So there's a wonderful coincidence that in the same week we have a distinguished speaker from a Jesuit university in the States who's come here to Cape Town. In the uh, commencement address, which I'm delighted to say Desmond Tutu did give at Gonzaga University uh, earlier this week, he talked to the uh, students about dreaming their dreams about rejecting cynicism and moving, developing a gentler and more equitable world. And I'm hoping that those are themes which will uh, certainly coincide with what Professor Jeannie is going to tell us today. The Jesuits have been involved in all kinds of education for over 400 years, and the Jesuit universities in the States, Georgetown was mentioned, uh, I mentioned Gonzaga and Chicago and Loyola, where our guest speaker this evening is from, are just part of a whole network of Jesuit institutions around the world. Uh, I uh, am director of the Jesuit Institute in South Africa, which is much, much smaller than those, but connected with them, and also involved in the activity of educating, of leadership, and of helping people, we hope, to build a gentler and more equitable world. <coughs> professor Gini is interested in such questions because he's a professor of business ethics. He started off his life uh, working in the area of philosophy, and uh, for over 40 years has been working at Chicago Loyola, the Jesuit University in Chicago. He is the chair of the Department of Management there at the School of Business Administration. He's also the co-founder of the Business Ethics Quarterly. So that means that he's looking not only at his own work, but a whole host of work in business ethics around the world. And when he's not uh, um, a, uh, an academic in an institution, he's also what I think gets termed a public intellectual. He appears on uh, radio programs and television stations in the States, particularly in the Midwest, talking about issues of philosophy and business ethics. But you don't have to go all the way to the States to hear him. He was actually on Cape Talk and 702 this morning on the Reedy Clavi show, uh, engaging with her on the question of business ethics and some of the ethical questions which uh, we face in companies here in South Africa. He's written a whole host of books, and the titles of those really uh, spring out from the, from, the, from the page. Why it's hard to be good the importance of being lazy. And I love this quote, this uh, title in particular, God can quote me on that. Okay. Well, that may also be a book by Desmond Tutu, I suspect. Um, and he's also, uh, was telling me the other day, he did, he's done uh, uh, some interesting analysis of leadership, looking at the work of Abraham Lincoln, uh, to coincide with, with his 200th birthday, and obviously uh, the question of, of, of um, Lincoln's presidency, linking with the presidency of Barack Obama, and the role of leadership in that. We're delighted to have him visiting us here in South Africa. Uh, this is by, by no means his first visit to South Africa, and indeed he has a very, very close connection with Cape Town, because would you believe he married his wife in the Mount Nelson Hotel, which must be a wonderful place to get married, beautifully romantic. And so he was delighted when I said that we had an opportunity to uh, come down to Cape Town uh, to give a talk here. We may manage to fit in a little visit to the to the Nelly. I'm not sure that going with me will be quite as romantic. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but we'll, we'll somehow we'll somehow try and recap. <coughs> so uh, on your behalf, I'm delighted to welcome Professor Al Gini and to invite him to speak to us this evening. Very, very, very much. It was very, it was very sweet. But uh, I 
feel I'm, I'm, I'm troubled to begin with I'm being compared to a tutu. To follow a tutu would be impossible. I, I once did for five minutes and I was laughing so hard. The man has the gift of laughter and I, and I wish I had it. Also, I'm very, very glad that you serve drinks first because I'm much better when you've had a couple drinks. So <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm profound at my 9.30 class in the morning when I ask my undergraduates to drink. So I, I know. <laughs> Now, as a professor of business ethics, I'm regularly asked, why is business always bad? And the answer is, it's not. At least not always. Now, according to Alan Greenspan, it's all about the human condition. Unless somebody can figure out a way to change human nature, we will always have more crises and more ethical scandals. These things, you know, don't change. Now, I'm a card-carrying capitalist. And the line that I use in my MBA class in the very first night in a required course is, I understand money. I've got a, a huge mortgage, a high-performance car, and a high-maintenance wife. <laughs> so I understand money. I own more than one suit and one pair of clothes, so on and so forth. And I'm involved in the system. And I must tell you that I am so proud, recently, of the Catholic Church in regards to the Pontifical Council on Justice and Peace, in regards to their statements about the role of business in the world. If you haven't read, read it, read it. It is a brief appraisal to everything I believe in in business ethics and, and worthwhile. And as a character and capitalist, uh, I want to argue, yes, the system does make mistakes. And yes, business can do bad things. But business is not bad per se, not inherently bad. In fact, we have an obligation to do business in so far that we are part of a community of others. Yes, the, the problem is that business offers temptations. And yes, we often find ourselves on a slippery slope. But when things go bad, we need to look at the, uh, yes, we need to look at the collective system, but we have to look at the individual players as well. That is, I think we need to look, not, uh, look at not just the engine, but the engineers too. Not just the game, but the players as well. I don't think we can blame Wall Street for burning, uh, uh, Bernie Madoff. I mean, Bernie Madoff did some. Wall Street is a slippery place to be because salary, stuff, success, and, and futures are there. But it isn't because, OK, it's a bad place to do it but rather uh, it offers temptation. So I think it's important to critically look at business and business persons as well. And I think it's important to remember that to be critical, and I want to offer kind of some critical reflections tonight, in the classic sense, because I was trained as a philosopher, and I, it's hard to overcome that, is to take apart and to put it back together again in a better way. So to be critical of a system doesn't mean to destroy the system, I think, uh, but rather to understand the system. So I want you to sit back to, uh, tonight and think of this as philosophical reportage on business, ethics, and leadership. And I'm going to be using an old model, Enron, but I think that model, uh, I think, is reflected in today. Now, sadly, I think most people think that it's either business or ethics, and that they have to make a choice. And I want to argue that you can do good and do well as well. Now, conventional wisdom uh, paradoxically tells us that even though change is constant, uh, certain things never really change. Or even when they, things seem to change, they wind up coming back again and again and again. Now, I think not all conventional wisdom is a simple, casual cliche. Things do tend to repeat themselves. As the American philosopher George Santa Anna has said, those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. And I think, that the, uh, I, I think that's really critically important. Now, sadly, in the field of business ethics, it doesn't require an encyclopedia of knowledge or a huge leap of imagination to come up with examples to substantiate Santana's claim. For example, in the 1920s, there was Charles Ponzi's famous postal coupon scam. By the way, Charles Ponzi, I said Italian fellow, about this tall 32 right here. That's an inside joke if you're Italian. But um, <laughs> uh, after the Pope, right, the Pope, the, 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 the bishop is here to tell you that a major requirement of the Pope became important in the 36th right there. We got too much invested in garments and so we went. Charles Ponzi, $20 million in three years. $20 million? You probably have that in your pocket. Right now. I mean, I mean, in some sense, but he started something that we had to understand, the Ponzi scheme. In 1970s in America, it reappeared with Robert Vesco and his mutual fund scam. And in the 80s, there was a chap called Charles Keaton and his double booking accounting scam. That comes back again and again. And then, of course, there's Ivan Boski in the 80s and his charges of insider trading. And, and, and then in America and in the world, of course, the uh, doyen of domesticity, Martha Stewart, 
who went to jail not for insider trading, but for lying about insider trading, et cetera, et cetera. Or how can any of us forget Michael Milliken and his, uh, and his pushing the limits of uh, financial risk taking in the junk bond industry? By the way, I had his secretary's son in class this semester who still wants to defend him as a nice guy. <laughs> um, now, uh, now, we can now add a long list. Of course, this seems like ancient history. To undergraduates, uh, I, when I was, by the way, I, I taught this course at Lincoln, and I had to point out to my undergraduate and said, no, Lincoln was not my lawyer. Yes, he was my classmate, but he was not my lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> so when you mention some of these things, am I? But then what persists is kind of this iconic moment in business ethics, uh, which we measure others against, and which our culture has developed that. But to this list that I just mentioned, we can now add another whole list of contemporary players who, in the last couple of years, either through mistakes or mismanagement or misconduct, put the entire system at peril. AIG, Burns, Avera Stearns, Lehman Brothers, Goldman Sachs, the entire mortgage industry in America um, uh, um, and what it did to us. And then let's not forget Bernie Madoff. Bernie Madoff ran a real scheme and then another Ponzi scheme. $65 billion. Now people have asked me, how do you get away with that? It was real simple. It's called trust. He said he didn't want anybody, he didn't want this young lady to uh, invest in him because you've only got two or three million in the bank. My God, you'll want to draw on that every once in a while. I want people who have that 40 million and never really need to touch that principal. And I'm always going to make you 12%. Should that have been a warning someplace, 12%? Because the last time any man these made 12% on anything. And he did it. So he, he limited the clients out. There are only 1,400 people. That little, uh, that little group. And they, until one day, when the market went wrong, he had an $8 billion call. Well, he didn't have $8 billion. And, and, uh, and, and that's what happened. So, uh, by the way, uh, being Italian uh, and Jewish, I, by the way, have built coming and going. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I want the uh, Ponzi scheme. I don't want it to be Ponzi scheme. I want it to be the Madoff scheme. <laughs> Give the right ethnicity to um, but even with all of this, and, and many, many more, I mean, it's happening, and of course, you have a hero local in South African hero, and the letter to the New York Times in regard to leaving Goldman Sachs about, uh, uh, about the enterprise of Goldman Sachs and how we're no longer concerned about really the investors uh, that we work for. Um, even with all these players, there remains this culprit, uh, Enron, and to its dismay, Enron has become an icon of an era. I mean, uh, and if you haven't seen the film, um, and, and haven't studied Enron at all. Just rent the film, buy the film, smartest guy in the world. Because it's a documentary. They actually say these things out loud to a camera that you can't believe. Uh, that they're, they're, bilking, they're selling stocks that have no value, have not connected to any product, but they're selling it at market price. And so what's the problem with that? Um, and they built everyone, including themselves, uh, out of billions of them. Um, I think it's become a poster child for corporate mismanagement. A shorthand for corporate greed, and a case study worthy, I think, of serious consideration. Um, as a friend of mine said, um, it's really, uh, Enron is really Ponzi Watts. Uh, they promised to deliver energy that they didn't own or possess or have any means of ever finding. And if you lived long enough, it was like the Monty Python insurance policy, the great insurance policy. Uh, it was uh, simple payments, but it was invalidated if you died. Um, <laughs> So what happened at Enron? How did it go, move from um, a, 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 a corporate America's paragon a virtue to one of its chief pariahs? Enron had a 17 year, the 17 year Texas miracle. When it really started in 1985 uh, in Oklahoma with oil wells and some gas wells. By the way, further embarrassment, a PhD in finance uh, and, the, and, and the, a preacher's son. And I was on the board, uh, uh, many time panels with him, a very, very nice man. Every museum in America got a painting from him, got a donation from him, so on and so forth. And full disclosure requires me to tell you that I helped write your ethics uh, standards. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I have a couple copies left, they're going for $500. <laughs> um, it became the sixth largest energy corporation in 17 years. And it was in the top 10 of the Fortune 500 when it had been subdivised, and one of the best companies to work for in America where people fought. Now the question to be asked is, is Enron the result of the failure of business ethics? Now let me give you the perfect business answer. 
Yes, sir. Um, <laughs> and it depends how, depends how you look at this. Uh, on the one hand, um, next to the Hippocratic Oath, the accounting profession claims to have the second oldest ethics standards. And, and, the, thick, and, the, and the book is this thick um, and, uh, on what you can and cannot do. And the AI CPA standards in America require all CPAs to take these uh, requirements. Holly, a pleasure to see you. I can't believe a middle of South Africa and a colleague who is uh, 100 miles away from me. I just walked in. This happens all the time, doesn't it? <laughs> okay. Now, on the other hand, rules, as Arthur Levin, uh, really a kind of cultural hero for me, former chairman of SEC, uh, and he left because he was just too damn honest. He says, rules, regulations, requirements, and guidelines exist in abundance, and so does the web of dysfunctional relations among analysts, brokers, and individuals. And I think always when you break ethics down, and, uh, and, the, and the book that I was so uh, proud of in writing about ethics was uh, why it's hard to be good is, ethics, so people say, well, what is ethics? Well, here's a simple metaphor that I think really does work. I think ethics is about the willingness to stand outside of the shadow of ourselves. Now, there's a paradox here. You can't. Every time I move, that shadow moves me. And I think ethics is the willingness to not simply be concerned with self. And somehow in business, we built, we accepted the notion that business is about self and only self. That's like, what, what value is it to be the richest man in the world if no one else has money? What value is it to be, you know, that's like being the tallest midget? <laughs> <laughs> business is always communal. The business requires us to be concerned with self. Yes. And so we don't forget, and Ali will tell you this too, Adam Smith had a degree in philosophy. He was a professor of moral ethics. And he was writing economics to study household management, the ethics of household management. And it wasn't to act alone. It wasn't to be uh, totally uh, no concern for others. It's to act within the sympathy and the needs of others. So business has always been about this collectivity. But we think, especially in America, we think of Wall, Wall Street. There's a wonderful article by Neil Ferguson. He said, the real reason for the failure of Wall Street is the gods taught these people higher mathematics. <laughs> and that they became lost in the mathematical use of money and forgot that money is not just about the, cre uh, the creation of wealth, but the creation of value and the creation of purpose for others. John Dobson, a useful friend of all of mine, once said that ethical guidelines are often, too often viewed the same way as legal or accounting rules, something to circumnavigate. Now, I think there is, I believe, a rather simple scenario, an explanation for all of this. It's all about the money. It's, but more than just the money, it's also all about the game. Um, Tony Soprano has hit the shores here, has it not? The mm -hmm. For years, I didn't want to watch The Sopranos. I thought, oh, great, another Italian melodrama where everybody eats a lot of garlic and then shoots somebody. Great, I've never seen that before. Right, right away. And then it wound up not being a murderous melodrama, but rather a morality play. And Tony wanted to be capo di capo. He wanted to be the toughest guy in the room, beat up anybody, but go home and help his daughter with French so she can get in Yale. Doesn't work out that way, does it? You can't have that kind of schizophrenic activity. And I think he wanted to be a player. Talk about player, we're all right here. Can we still hear me? No matter what? We have technical assistance. I can't believe that this is coming. Okay, sorry about that. Hang on. I shouldn't just stick with the red. I just stick with the red. I guess I didn't have to tell you that it was Italian. I'm not doing all By the way, you know what you call an Italian who's one arm shorter than the other? Somebody suffered from a speech impediment. But anyway. <laughs> Tony wanted to be master of the universe. What's happening on Wall Street right now? They want to be master of the universe. They want to be a big set. Think about this in, in, in regard to Enron. Why didn't Fast Style? By the way, I also love telling the story. First time in the NBA class at Loyola University in Chicago, where we're lovely competitors with Georgetown. Um, uh, we're larger, but they're better. I know, I know. I know. Uh, and, you know, I gave you credit for it. I gave you credit for it. Okay. But George Brinker, great man, great man. Okay. 
and, and so is John Tesla. So on. Um, anyway, um, uh, I started to tell a story and I forgot the story. Quick, what was it? First class. First class at Loyola, I said, right, ladies and gentlemen, why are you here tonight? Well, let me make it very clear. Right now, you're standing, you are seven miles directly south of Northwestern University. Last year, voted number two in MBA programs in the world. And you are now seven miles directly north of University of Chicago uh, MBA program. Uh, two years ago, voted number one in the world. Both have graduates in jail because of that. I'm we have zero. Now, a cynic amongst you would say we're more clever and able to <laughs> to be a player, to be someone. Think of sports. Think of the madness in this country of soccer. And I know you call it football. I'm sorry, I cannot call it football. Um, uh, uh, in, in football. Uh, and, 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 and think of rugby. And think of the madness we have around sports. These are people who want to be the big criminal, who want to be in the action, who live on this narcissism, who cannot step out of the shadow of self, who will not step out of the shadow of self, who need not. For me, for the most part, it's about the money. It's about greed. It's about being a player. It's what Willie Sutton, the famous uh, depression bank robber, said when he was caught, the, the, the Tribune reporter at Chicago Jail says, hey, how come you always rob banks? He looked at him and says, because that's where the money is. <laughs> <laughs> now, it's not that humans have become, as Alan Greenspan, and by the way, I have three Alan Greenspan quotes in this presentation. And they're the only quotes I've ever been able to understand from Alan Greenspan. That's why I included them in here. And you know, you're going to blow the crunch of the uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and I agree with Preston. Thank you. <laughs> he said, it's not that humans have become any more greedy than in generations past. It's that the venues to express that greed have grown enormously. Remember, Edwin was during the Clinton administration. And even my libertarian father-in-law, uh, uh, you know, um, he had to say, okay, I made money under uh, Clinton. We, the college professors, made money under Clinton, for goodness sakes. We all made money under Clinton. Threw money at the wall and you made money under Clinton. And, and because of that, the risk went up and up and up and up. And you forget that risk management is about reasonable risk. I just came back from Gettysburg College. And gave, and gave a speech. And as part of my tea, I said, I want to tour the battlefield by two historians. And I had this incredible tour. And I'm doing a paper now on Lee's dysfunctional leadership to send 15,000 men across two miles between cannon <laughs> with no support. Brilliant. And it's because he didn't want to lose to his students. Lee left all his combat to West Point. Uh, Lee did one leap the field. Lee thought his armies could beat them, even though there were fewer in number. He mismanaged. Um, but I think that, you know, what we're talking about here is, have we mismanaged the situation? Have we, have, we, have we taken it too far? You know, I started to say fast out. Fast out <coughs> somewhere along the line, misplaced, mismanaged, uh, or, or took $390 million. Did he think he was going to be able to spend it, about $20 million next year, or $50 million in 10 years? What was he going to do with that money? That money was tied up. He never could really have access to it. It's the game. It's the greed. We made money, but we forgot that money has to be used. I mean, St. Thomas said it a long time ago. I got marked it down. I quoted St. Thomas. Uh, said a long time ago, money can be fakun. It can be real. It can be aid. But money in and of itself. Now, according to um, Journal of Accounting, I, gosh, I had to read the Journal of Accounting for this. Um, everyone can be characterized by an uh, individual and collective greed born in an atmosphere of market euphoria and arrogance. When everyone thought we do it. Jerry Wilkinson of the LA Times says, the only difference today between big shot corporate executives or accountants, stock analysts, and bank robbers is that bank robbers <coughs> used guns and wore masks when they took our money. <laughs> now having said all this, I think the central problem with business ethics today is not lack of moral reasoning or even moral imagination, but rather moral leadership. I don't think anybody comes out of my business ethics says, oh, you can't double dip. I, did, I can't keep two sets of books. I didn't know that. I didn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> so you can't steal. You can't steal from people you don't know. Why did somebody tell me? I think the real issue is leadership. 
and the tone and quality of the culture that leadership creates, and the tone and quality of the expectations of leadership. I think the reality is leadership like ethics does exist in theory, but it's only true when practiced face to face. For me, ethics is a noun, and not a noun, and not a noun, not a naming word. It's a verb, it's something you do. So is leadership. As Newt Rockne, this is for you, Ali, uh, said, one man practicing leadership is far better than 50 preaching it. Now, uh, before Enron et al., remember when accountants were guardians of truth? Remember when Jack Walsh from GE was thought of as, you know, the, that, until the sloppy divorce and somebody who didn't read his green up and, uh, you know, found out about a lot of things? Remember when CEOs were visionaries and celebrities? Not defendants doing the perp walk on national television at night. By the way, it was Rudy Giuliani who said, put him in orange, put him in handcuffs, take him off from the camera. So you really, I thought that was totally appropriate. Remember when CEOs were kings, when Leah Iacocca was not just head of Chrysler, was head of the automobile industry and said to Jimmy Carter, give me $350 million. It doesn't even sound like anything, right? $350 million. I'll save the automobile industry. When with Bill Gates uh, changed, transformed everything at Microsoft, when and recently Steve Jobs, I, of course, you hate him, he's had some impact on the world, check it out. When Jack Welch uh, changed GE from the light bulb company into this major Fortune 500, and so on and so forth. So today's CEOs in the spotlight, uh, Dennis uh, Kozlowski, who's finally out of jail, by the way, uh, after serving eight years. John Regas of Adelphi. Um, I have some pity for John Regas because he started a, a, an industry um, uh, uh, based on movies and, and so on and so forth. And he bought a movie theater and he made the popcorn and sold the juju pizza. I don't know. Juju pizza doesn't translate in South Africa. It's also gummy bears, okay? Close enough. Hard gummy bears. And, uh, and then somewhere along the line, he was dipping into money. He said, it's in my company. What's the problem, right? But his two sons, one who had an MBA from Harvard, one who had an MBA from Yale, should have done the difference. One of them <laughs> is in the cell next to him. Uh, <laughs> uh, Bernie Evers uh, from WorldCom was, will die in jail, the most English teacher. Um, uh, Jeff Skillings, who uh, <laughs> got a sense to from 28 years to 24, I'm sure that makes a huge difference. <laughs> Once again, I can't lay a man who I'm convinced uh, committed suicide rather than uh, uh, anything else. And John Corzine of at, 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 at Global, uh, I've been out of the country for four days since he's been convicted yet, but I'm sure he will be. Now, having said that, you can't just limit it, but of course, South Africa, I've been to a couple of political things the last couple of days. I understand we have some problems, it's just fine. <laughs> um, and, and by the way, I am a South African. Uh, I am an honorary citizen of South Africa, the, uh, the ambassador in Chicago. So it was such a fear. I didn't bring it to prove it, but trust me, I didn't. <laughs> um, but uh, 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 and I'm very proud to be a citizen of Illinois, where in my lifetime, four, not one, not two, not three, but four governors have gone to jail. So, uh, our partner, the, the Democrats are winning. Otto Werner, a Democrat, uh, a Walker, a Democrat, um, um, quick, 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 um, uh, George Ryan, and now Mr. Goodwine, which uh, is finally in jail. And, he, and he's going to do 14 years and just couldn't figure it out. If you want to study narcissism, it's, his name is Bob Goodwine, which is why he's going to do. And so it, it, what we're talking about is what does leadership do? And I think leadership is creates a culture. My friend Steve Priest. Uh, has said a long time ago of, um, that culture always trumps compliance and always is what we palpably know more than the rules. What's expected here? What's going on here? Robert Jackal once said, uh, culture is important because what's right in a corporation is not what's right in a person's home or church. What's right in a corporation is what the guy above you demands that you do. And you do it because so much is at stake. However, um, leadership, whether it's good or bad, I think, is about um, leadership, good or bad, sets the tone, I think, establishes the agenda <coughs> as an uh, um, organizational life. And to explain this, even to undergraduates, they say, you're working at McDonald's, you have one here, you're so lucky, I'm just, you're in civilization, oh my god. Um, uh, the wonderful people to work for, by the way, as a consultant, but I, I'm waiting for food. Um, uh, <laughs> In um, point of fact, uh, you know, they do sometimes you work in the house, and the soup, that, that shift supervisor is in a bad mood. Well, your, your, your shift is ruined. The tone of a supervisor in a small office, you're having a bad day, you're having a bad day. 
So think about a large corporation. You know, it, it does spindle down in very real ways. And James McGregor Burns said, we all think about leadership, we all want to talk about leadership, but we know so little about leadership. It's a least understood phenomenon in the world. But we think it's a great elixir. We think we're hoping that the right leader in the right place settles all the problems. And we confuse leadership with all sorts of things, with being in charge, the name, the title, the notoriety, the cult of personality, etc., etc., etc. But as John Garner has pointed out, even in a large corporation or a government agency, the top ranking person may simply be bureaucrat number one, and who we'll, we'll, we'll couldn't take a, a group of seven year olds to the ice cream counter for free ice cream cones. <laughs> or my favorite quote is from Price Pritchett, who said, uh, putting a person in charge and making them a leader is like giving a person a Bible and calling them a preacher. Bestowing the title does not necessarily bestow the will. And yet I think we desire leadership, even though it's missing. We want leadership. We're fascinated by it. We're furious about it. We struggle against it. And so tonight I want to offer, uh, as quickly as I can, and we'll be out of here by 11.30. <laughs> not only at midnight. I absolutely promise. Um, I want to talk about, I think, Nine critical tasks or jobs of leadership, or characteristics of leadership. Everyone's got their own. Leadership is the most written about topic in social science and organizational behavior. Since, 19, um, since 1999, 23,000 uh, books on for leadership has uh, been published with current leadership. And the title. Um, I'll have one out next year, and I'm sure that'll be the definitive one always. <laughs> <laughs> um, and by the way, my agent says, if I get the word leadership, a color, and the, and the word cat in the title. It's a bestseller. I'm working on it. <laughs> so I want to talk about nine critical jobs. I want to talk about stewardship, emotional intelligence, courage, vision, being in charge or power, teaching, coping with change, trust, and leadership. It's easy to start with the first one, to start with stewardship and character. I am convinced that leadership is about the character of the individual to begin with. It's about living out what that person believes and finding out what that person believes before we make them a leader. I think it's about, um, I think a person of character and leadership is concerned about the rights of others and not simply self. I think leadership is about being a steward to others. I was at recently St. Augustine College, it's a very tough for St. Augustine College. My favorite quote on leadership comes from St. Augustine who said, the first and final job of leadership is the attempt to serve the needs and the well-being of the people they lead. Peter Drucker updated that and some years later and says, leadership doesn't ask, what do I want to do? It asks, what needs to be done? And it remembers that its job is others, not self, and that you're there for others and not self. And I think, as uh, Peter Senge has pointed out, leaders recognize that the ultimate purpose of their work is not about self. It's like you read Maslow in every, every management book, you know, every uh, hierarchy of beings. Maslow wasn't talking about everybody being self-actualized so we could look in the mirror every morning and say, thank God it's me. <laughs> and, and, you know, and I'm better every day and every way. You know? um, <laughs> my wife has stopped me from saying that. I'm better, I'm better. <laughs> Children are being affected. My like children are 40 and 45. I can't understand that equation. Nevertheless, um, um, you know it's to be better with others. The purpose of finding out about self is to look what I think, um, and, and my brief and all of business ethics has been the Socratic model, that the purpose of life is not to avoid suffering, pain, or death, or even the acquisition of power and fame. It's to learn how to live well with others, and to be remembered by others after you're no longer living. I think that what we're talking about in stewardship is that leadership is always, unfortunately, this happens very often in Catholic circles and in religious circles. Stewardship is meaning called shepherd. And there's something that I, I, I'm very uncomfortable with the shepherd Bible because ultimately, what does the shepherd do? He slows all the sheep. <laughs> uh, it's not a good model for leadership. <laughs> 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 I, I, I could be wrong about that. Uh, you know, and, and I'm sorry, the, 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 the shepherd goes out, leaves the whole flock to get the one. Uh, this is bad management. You can have a silly time argument for a lot of folks. This is bad management. But this notion of you don't exist. Um, to show you how old I really am, and by the way, he said 40 years, you're very kind, it's been 44 years. Um, Khalil Gibran, in a book called The Prophet, said about children, I've always remembered this, he says, your children are, to an, are, as a, a, are an arrow to an archer. You have the bow, you have the bow. They're not yours. And I think stewardship is about others, not you. 
You may be the bow. Emotional intelligence. We could be here forever. I could just bring my therapist in and they could talk about me. We could talk about that. But I think emotional intelligence here is the old kind of power. Know thyself. Why do you want the job? In the presidency of any, the president of the United States, I love Barack Obama. I actually played basketball with Barack Obama. Uh, I know you're a happy for me. Um, <laughs> and by the reason, the reason we always wear is uh, sweatpants is very thin legs. So you look funny. But, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, putting that as an aside, why would anybody want that job? That's, have you seen what he looks like right now? <laughs> He's an old man. Remember when Bill Clinton was dying his hair when he first went into the presidency? He didn't have to. He left without that. I just uh, I just had lunch with Bill Daly. Am I dropping names? Is that enough dropping names? <laughs> <laughs> I also was on a panel of stuff. Uh, Bill Daly was, uh, was his uh, uh, aide, uh, chief of staff, and he quit for all sorts of political reasons. And uh, he was the commencement speaker at Loyola, and, uh, and I had done some work with him before. And I, he said, you look great. He said, yeah, I feel great. He said, the only thing is, I, I, I went back to the bank, he's working at Chase Bank. He said, I went back to the bank, do something, and I got shingles. And the doctor says, it was stress. I said, what are you talking about stress? I just said, the most stressful job in the whole world. You know, I had an order that hit on the summit of London, and you're telling me we're getting a bank is stressful? Well, you're crazy. <laughs> <laughs> I said, Bill, I, I think it's a little stressful. <laughs> uh, but he said it was a killer job. He thought he was going to die. He says, forget the politics. I felt that room. Remember all, remember the, you all know the picture, right? They're all in that war room. They're watching the man be killed. The only person you don't see is the Domino Pizza guy coming in. That's <laughs> in the back. Um, because it looks like something from an Arnold Schwarzenegger film, he said, I had a word of that. Do you know what that meant? That was a coordination of hundreds of thousands of people and all sorts of resources. And we had to go through all of that. He had to finally make the final call. He, that call wasn't decided until two minutes before those guys got off the helicopter. You know, the local preparation says, that's a killing job. I said, why does anybody want it? He says, I don't know, but thank God somebody knows. <laughs> Now, as a car camera Democrat, I don't feel that way about Mr. Romney, but nevertheless, I swore that <laughs> But you know, he, but he, he, you have to know why you want the job. You have to know why you want to do that. Why do I want to be company? Why do I want to be this company's president? Because I have a gift? Because I have a talent? Because it's my turn? But it's not mine. And pass it on. You know, the, the, uh, the British the medical model is the best model for leadership. Learn one, do one, teach one, and pass it on. That's what we're all about. So, emotional intelligence, know yourself. Know your strengths. Bill Clinton worked the room. You've all seen that man. I mean, walked in, shook hands, did this, so so. You know, Richard Nixon, the famous picture of Richard Nixon, relaxing on the beach in California, walking in the surf in a sport jacket, a tie, wingtips, and his pants rolled up in the water. That was Richard Nixon relaxing. <laughs> you know? Uh, and so we're talking about people, uh, 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 talking about people knowing themselves. You know the big uh, commentary, I'm sure you have your own president to, to, to to have issues with the big country about Mr. Obama right now in Washington is he's not there at night. He doesn't he doesn't press the flesh. He's he's not a bunker. He's an introvert. He wants to be with his family. He's with it all the time. He will work after the girls are in bed. He's an introvert. He doesn't need the parties. Now some say his wife will let him go, but I don't think sure. <laughs> he's serious. He knows himself that he can't do it all the time. All right? He needs to do it. There's a famous uh, story, um, and work goes the other way. Jimmy, uh, this applies to Jimmy Durante, but this also applies to Bob Hope. Oh, he kept performing into his 90s, you know, and, and George Burns. Yes, and why is it, George Burns actually was at his 99th birthday party. He walked up the stage, and he said, those of you uh, who had money that wouldn't make it out of here, you lost. Those of you who had money that won't make it to the show, your money's still alive. You know, and he did He did <laughs> Why was he so performing? He says, I don't need the money. I need the work. I need to express myself with others. And I think leaders need to lead, but they need to know why. What about the skeletons in the closet? Everybody, you know, the first, uh, anybody remember who the first uh, female uh, vice, uh, vice presidential candidate, to Joe Jogging Ferraro, a uh, wonderful human being, and then it wound up that she was compromised at the end because although her husband was a good man, having, a, again, being Italian, having a lot of the balls in his name, he was connected He's, to his family. He had done nothing. But that, you know, he, she didn't realize that. Excuse me, who's vetting these people, all right? Who just got fired at uh, Google? Was it Google this week? Because he falsified his uh, degree. Who vets yeah. these people, you know? You're, you're up for something, what's, what's going on? Knowing who you are, knowing if you want to do it. And here's the big issue for me. Do you like people? If you don't, what are you doing this for? You know, stay with your computer, 
run your own preparing for it. <laughs> courage. To paraphrase the words of Winston Churchill, moral courage is the first of all human qualities because it is the quality that guarantees all others. I think moral courage is the readiness to endure danger for the sake of principle. Moral courage, I think, rejects voyeurism and seeks engagement. Moral courage is the willingness, it's not readiness to endure danger. It sounds too dramatic. I think moral courage is the willingness to do something, to live out something that we value. And the word from Eleanor Roosevelt, if you want to know a person's values, check their checkbook. What are they spending money on? How are they spending money? What are they value? So I think moral courage is about the willingness to not just say, this, here, this is what I believe, but actually living out that belief. And I think we need that in leaders. I, and, and, and Mr. Obama may have, uh, you know, uh, in his own epitaph, says, I mean, this, deciding on this bill may make me a one-term president, but I can't vote for this bill. What a concept. Because right now, it seems to me, in, in leadership and politics, that they're running to stay in office, not running to help those in office. I mean, a uh, user office now. Fourth characteristic here is vision. <coughs> My favorite quote, I actually think Ali, you gave me this a long time ago. Next to three, the first responsibility of a leader is to define reality. To say, this is what I expect here. This is what I want from you. This is what I'm designed to, 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 to do. This is what I won't accept from you. you know? Nobody wants the boss who never tells you anything. The, time you find, the, time, the first time he talks to you is when you did something wrong and then she chews you out. Who wants to work for that person? I think leadership has to say, this is what we're going to do, this is how we're going to do it, this is what we will accept, this is what we won't accept. This vision thing, which often becomes overly romantic, I think is the first principle of leadership. It defines the territory. You know? I remember my son said to me, why do I have to cut the grass? Because I don't want to. <laughs> Me, this is a community. You're stronger than I am. I have other things to do. Et cetera, et cetera. And you have to partake in me, but why do I have to boss it? This is an L set. Do it or I'll kill you. <laughs> <laughs> I always feel that physical threats, you know, uh, are, and, and the end with children are, are the best possible. <laughs> My son is six foot five and would have murdered me. <laughs> um, but I do think what we're talking about is uh, it's, uh, talking about what's your mission? What are we doing here? You know, I want you to get more. What are we doing here? What's important? We're talking about, say, getting jobs. We feel, all I'm doing is selling X. Does the world need X? Well, sometimes. You know, I'm making hula hoops. Well, remember hula hoops? Okay. Well, it's really hot summer day, and you got eight kids in the backyard. You know what to do with them? Bring out the sprinkler, get some hula hoops. Sounds okay to me. But you want hula hoops, so they're not going to be naval destroyers because there's a nail stick. Uh, it's too late in the evening, you haven't had the But anyway, um, so a good hula hoop all the time is an important thing. And I think what we forget in work, and I've been a student of work for a long time, it's not just what we do, it's how we do it, and the value of what's being done for others. We forget that, that somebody may need that. You know, you, you, don't, you don't hang around with a plumber until you have a plumbing problem, but then you want to be a plumber. Let's look up for the cheap one. Oh, no, 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 no. The basement is just, the pipe is just broken, and the house is filling with materials I don't want to discuss right now. No, let's take the good plumber. Right? That's what I think with vision, if there's a, a limit to vision, uh, Martin Luther King uh, said it beautifully, if you want to move people, I think this is true in politics, in social organizations, in the church, and in business, if you want to move people, that's to a vision that is positive for them, that taps something important in them, that gives them something to desire, that is presented in a compelling way, that inspires them, and that is not almost impossible to do. You know, Weight Watchers. Hi, my name is Al. I'm 290 pounds. I want to lose 180 pounds by next week. <laughs> Rather, hi, my name is Al. I lost pounds week. The, the use model of AA. Number five, power. Being in charge. Now, in leadership studies, you're never supposed to vote military people. I always thought that was a ridiculous rule. One thing for co-workers say, let's get together and get this project done. The other thing that say is that we're going on that hill, we need to take that position. Those men are in danger over there. Unfortunately, half of us are not making the back. Questions? <laughs> 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 That's the leadership of another quality and the leadership 
audacity. Your pet was really a student of, of human behavior as well as a very strange person for another lecture at another time. That the first rule of commanding is to act as you're in charge because you are. Take six six year olds tomorrow out to the uh, where did you want to go the aquarium? Uh, the aquarium and say meet you back here in two hours. Goodbye. <laughs> 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 You have to be in charge of that. I mean it, we're going here now, not next week, now. And in some sense, you have to be in charge. You also said, a leader cannot lead by remote control of the Wisconsin's office. Leadership is about being a driver, not simply being a, a passenger. And what we're talking about here, of course, is the use of power and how power is used. And I think that, unfortunately, in America, we don't like to talk about the word power because it has negative connotation. The power from the left is posting be able to change to a fact. And I think you need power. I want my surgeon to have power to take my gallbladder out and only my gallbladder. <laughs> I need my dentist to be able to have the power to stop this terrible pain in, 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 my, in my jaw. I need my lawyer to tell me that I will be able to keep at least 3% of my take home pay after the divorce. But anyway, <laughs> I don't think I can get 3%. You should be her lawyer. She is a lawyer. I am in a mixed marriage. My wife is a lawyer. <laughs> I can take the fact she's in this companion with the Republican things, right? Six, teaching. Ironically, I think we forget the job of a leader is to teach. To make people aware of the agenda, to prepare people for the agenda, and, and, and to make people on board with the agenda. Because you can't lead the unwilling. And I think people need to understand. Just by saying, why do I have to have a lot? And I explain to them. You're part of this community. We all live here. Your mother goes, I do this. Well, you got a job. Now you're old enough to do it. I didn't ask you to get along when you were three. You're 13 now, and you're bigger than me. And I showed you how to use a machine. I think we need to teach. And then there's a critical job, uh, as Peter Sengley said. The task of the, uh, uh, the leader as teacher is to empower people with information, to make them aware of what they're doing rather than imposing it. Now, uh, I must give George Bush the second real kudos um, for his, uh, for the first year of his second uh, term in the presidency. He said, I have this political capital. What I want to do is change the social security laws in America. Now, it was a bad idea. It didn't, it didn't pass. I'm very glad it didn't pass. I, I get to collect my social security next year, and I want to all of it. Um, and, but uh, uh, I think it was the wrong idea, and so on and so forth. But he went around the country for about six months, just the way Mr. Obama spent a year of his presidency trying to get the new reform in regard to health care, which is yet to be decided but we'll leave that aside right now. He used his office as a bully pulpit to try to convince people this is a good idea. It was decided against it, but I want to honor him for using his office correctly to try to teach, to try to change information, to, to offer information, to try to offer an alternative position, which we had to vote on, which was really critical to vote on. So I think that's, that's really important. You, it just can't be fiat volunteers. It simply can't be command from above. It doesn't work. It never works in the long term. Not today anymore, certainly. <laughs> Not today with these electronic devices where everyone's got input, everyone's got a say. So I think it's really important to understand that part of the job of leadership is to evoke, to offer people what's going on so it's not a hidden agenda. Number seven, change. I think change, you know, this notion of continuous movement, novelty, is the central issue of all leadership. Because no leader you know, the one, first principle of military strategy is all strategic plans immediately change upon confronting the enemy. <laughs> so I two. Barack Obama said uh, in January of the first year, uh, excuse me, February uh, of his first year, he said, when I was nominated, uh, when I won the election in November, I thought my major challenge would be uh, Iran, Iraq, and Afghanistan, not Ford, General Motors, the bank. This is not the presidency he anticipated. Ironically, Mr. Bush, our first NBA president in America, um, uh, wanted, to, wanted to be the business president. He wanted to be commander in chief. He didn't want that either. Their presidencies have been shifted by the immediacies of the moment. Change is something that all leaders have to deal with. You come into an office, that office changes. The Heisenberg effect, as soon as you look at something, you change it, right? You're from the scientist. You. So if you get in something, you change it. And so you have to deal with that. And I think the burden and the true challenge of leadership is, uh, is dealing with that change. Believe it or not, Abraham Lincoln did not start the Civil War. 
he did not uh, send in uh, troops into Fort Sumner. He waited until they were fired on. He begged them not to fight, etc., etc. And then, he came, and then, what did Lincoln do for the next six months? He went to the, uh, 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 the Library of Congress every night and read military history <coughs> and figured out you know, what was going on and found the right general at the end of the war. He understood it. He never wanted to be that president. He wanted to end slavery, but he was hoping to do it. As a, as a member of, of the 60s, when I thought everything would change, there was a wonderful cartoon that I, I wish I now had to You notice I'm not using a PowerPoint. Um, uh, I understand computers are really, really good to catch on. Um, <laughs> <laughs> there's a wonderful cartoon of a group of people in an old people's home, uh, and, and a senior, excuse me, a senior citizen's facility. That's terrible. Uh, sorry, and, and, and one of them is, they're all wearing a t-shirt, and one says, hell no, I can't go. The other one is saying, um, don't trust anybody uh, under 80. Remember, Nick Jagger said nobody should be sitting in Black Hole after the 30. He's 68 this year, and they made a $389 this year on tour. So he's still singing. Um, one guy's wearing a t-shirt that says, make Viagra, not war. Um, and the other guy's saying, that person is too sexy for my depends. <laughs> we forgot we're old now. As my son said, Dad, you're old. You just haven't recognized. We forgot, we're still in our heads, right? But we're young, age reverse, we're going to be young forever. <coughs> Except half my friends who said that they're not dead. And I think that dealing with change you know, is, is this really difficult task in our personal lives, in business life, but as a leader, it's always different than before. As Leo Biscali, God, dare I quote him, I'm out of the country, so don't be like that. Um, if you don't like change, you're not going to enjoy the life. And I think the, the real challenge of leadership are the things that they don't know about. But you have to have a, 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 be a personality type to be open to those possibilities. I think the problem is made more compound as Alvin Toddler has talked about it. It isn't change, it's the increased pace and rate of change. In other words, the speed of, uh, of change has changed and forced us to go faster. All of us have in our pockets right now, there are many these laptops. Things that didn't exist five years ago. Right? Now you couldn't live without them. It would look tough. Who does not have a cell phone? I just won't have one. I send small signals to each other. I just don't want to. I don't want to be there. I die. I go here. I'll be playing with them. Yes. Um, I'm a writer. I try to, I try to hide from it. Um, I think I'm aware of that. Now, I haven't said that. I've hide that everything else. I've said, you know, and I can't remember that. But I run a phone and I tried to limit that. But think how we're addicted to these machines. You know, my wife said, my wife was going on a conference uh, before, two weeks before I left. And she called me every day. She missed me. I said, how can I? You're not, you're, you're, you're calling me every day. How can I? She's Skyping me. Hi, honey, I'm here. Yeah, right, great, great. Get, 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 I gotta go. <laughs> If you didn't answer that for four days, they would send out people to see that. All of you go on vacation, and what's the, what's the worst thing that happens when you get back? But you all bring them out, don't you? You all do. You're all you're shameful. Read my book, The Importance of Being Lazy. You didn't mention that. I need that money for my children. Uh, <laughs> you all take it with you. My wife, because she's now, not only that, she's COO of her firm. Last year, two years ago, we learned that's fun. I right? went on the trophy. And she's calling because she's got to figure it out. Okay, honey, well, you do this, and I'm going, I need to check. I'm on the phone, and I got a perfect answer. What? Elephants! And they're walking through camp. I got to go now. And we're running like hell. Right? <laughs> you know, I thought it would have been perfect justice that she had been crushed to death. <laughs> <laughs> so, take my phone, honey! <laughs> It's a rate of change. So you can't, you can't be gone for three weeks. Can any of you be gone for three weeks? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. So it's a rate of change. You know, I haven't read the paper in 40 years. Okay, fine. I'll take one. I'll get right here. Right? So I think that Toph was right. That the pace of our lives is radically altered. You get back to your office and you haven't looked at anything for a week. That's 500 emails. Maybe only 10 are critical, but you missed them. Why didn't you respond to me? I've been calling for two weeks. I was out of town. I'm up there. You could have still called. <laughs> Trust. Don't worry. I think 
I'm going to talk to uh, some financial people this week. In regard to business, in regard to human relations, in regard to friendship, I found out that uh, they went to my friend because he trusted me with some information today. And I trusted him. Isn't that the indices? Mm -hmm. The best friend when I speak about that. Well, maybe it's a small one. At the end of the week, you don't get four fly. That's not your best friend anymore. Trust this bond that we need to yeah, business deals are really important. Somewhere along the line, it's a hint. Then you lawyer up, then you bring the accounts, because it's complex. But it's trust. You don't want to do business with people. Seinfeld has been here, right, for a long time. Remember the soup Nazi? Was he, was he spinning that soup or not? Did the, the waitress drop that sandwich someplace or not? Did she put a finger in the coffee or not? Trust, we all do that. We get the plane, or did you check the credentials in the pot? I think trust is confidence in the character of another in regards to predictability, reliability, dependability, integrity, and regularity. And the best way to explain trust is the negative. My mother in law is a terrible cook, I always ate before I went to house with her. Because I can trust the fact that it would be cold, it would be late, and it would not be good. We all understand trust. You want to do business with people you trust. And I think that the, the problem of leadership is creating trust. Aristotle was right. Trust is the basis of decent political community. People must be able to trust one another in politics, in commerce, in battle. And I will tell you in America, we don't trust each other. Something's happened to that And I understand I'm going to the judiciary debate, judiciary debate last night. And one of the problems right now in South Africa is we're not sure if there's bound to trust in anyone. We need to re examine that. Trust. You know, infidelity between a, a woman and, and, and a man, it's not about I had sex with somebody else, it's, it's from the word fidele, to trust. You're unfaithful to me. That's the issue. It's not the sexuality, the act of sexuality. It's that you're unfaithful to me. You jeopardize our relationship. You undermine our, our relationship. Same thing with business. What Enron did, what Arthur Anderson also did as chief culprit in this as well, is it failed its fiduciary duties. But all undergraduates, and you're all MBA people, you know better, fiduciary does not mean financial obligation to another. It means an obligation to another based on trust. So again, we want to feed the bank through trust. You've never met a dog, it's too bad. The moment's had a lot of them, go find them. The trust work, right? Uh, but the reality is business is about trust. You, don't do, you, don't, you, you may do business with somebody you don't trust because you have no other alternative. But if you want to do business with somebody, you don't want to have a best friend you don't trust. You can't have a best friend you don't trust. You can't have a spouse you don't trust. Of course, you can have children you don't trust, but then you can't have children. I don't want to talk about that right now. I'm on vacation. I'm too sad. No. I'm just saying, it's just easy. But think about the importance of trust. The job of leadership is to say trust. I was there in Grand Park in Chicago. You all saw the film when he won, Barack Obama won. That was a sacred night. It was a sacred night that we all. Wanted to trust him. Hope for a real change. It's not yet determined. But trust it is real. And I think it's palpable. As my friend Robert Solomon, unfortunately, now dead, said, trusting is something we do. It's that, it's like, it's, you can't say to somebody, I love you once. You want to say it again? I told you, told you I love you about five years ago. Trust is an active engagement with another that you reinforce by continuous trust. And I think uh, Bob is right. It's something you build, and maintain, uh, and, and, and have to have to maintain by your demeanor, by your activity. And when you fail to do that, trust breaks apart. Francis Fukuyama, believe me, a name you don't feel uh, fool around with uh, in a public place after a <laughs> um, was right. He says, says trust is the social cement between individuals, um, but it's it's a living cement. It 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 it. it, it Read it for us. You have to maintain it. It's like, I guess, uh, redoing a wall, you know, a brick wall. You have to re 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 redo it, recycle it to, to maintain its place. So trust is not one and only time. As Cicely Bach has pointed out, when trust is destroyed, relationships die, societies falter, friendships collapse. And you don't do business with that people, those people feel want I don't like them. I don't want to give them my money. David Mamma was right. When trust dies, uh, whatever you, uh, uh, what happens is uh, 
the public, excuse me, whenever you do business with anyone, assume that you're in an adversarial relationship that you're out to cheat. It's easier to trust. Finally, leadership is plural. I've been studying leadership so long, and we all want the person. We all want Nelson Mandela to be 46, maybe right now. We all want Mr. Obama to be perfect. We all want our problems to go away, or Mr. By the way, people, your, 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 your people have been worried about judiciary balance and so forth. Can I just point out something to you as an aside? Do you mind? Every member of the Supreme Court is a Harvard graduate. Mitt Romney's term of degree is from Harvard. Barack Obama's term of degree is from Harvard. Even George Bush's term of degree is from Harvard. <laughs> I think there's a little meritocracy or a little a good old boy system everywhere. You bet. You bet. Um, and I think there's a, re a real problem. But here's the point in, in leadership. It's never one. You just can't have one good man, one good woman, one good person. It can't change everything. Leadership is about, I'm convinced, that leadership succeeds or fails by the people they hire, by their staff. My joke always is that Richard Nixon ultimately died for a medical staff infection. Um, <laughs> Much funnier than that. So <laughs> but it is true. It, leadership is always plural. Michael Jordan, I'm from Chicago, I'm top of my head, I'm sorry, uh, of basketball fame, didn't win any championships when he was the only player on that team. He needed at least two or three others. It's about others. Leadership is only successful as a team. My, my wife, who back when I was HR, always says, Who you hire says everything about who you're going to be. Who you bring on with you says everything about this. It's not just a, a, a title or a name or a salary. It's who you are. And companies become people. We know that in restaurants. Why don't we understand that in business? Do you go back to the restaurant where the cook, where the cook is made? No, never. Why would you go back to a company? So leadership, I think, is dependent upon who you bring on. And I think it's always plural. Um, I think that leaders and followers, as uh, James Craig Bernstein pointed out, are involved in a joint venture. But when you think about it, it's never done alone. I mean, yes, uh, Steve Jobs was this genius, kind of this maniacal genius who was part of time. But he wasn't working alone. In fact, he was neither a technician or an electrician or a trained uh, artist or a trained designer. But he had taste for all of it and knew how to make selections. Okay. Think about this. A little quiz. Who painted the ceiling? Don't answer. All at once. Who painted the ceilings of the Sistine Chapel? Who was the enemy? genius behind Bambi, Snow White, Fantasia, and Pinocchio, and who is regarded as the greatest artist of the 20th century. So, Padre, who painted the scene in the Sistine Chapel? If you don't know this one, you, you just give me your collar now and we're going to get this all right now. All right, no. <laughs> Michelangelo. It was Michelangelo. Was it? No, Michelangelo and 250 other Italian guys up there. You know what? He's painting fresco. I'm not about this. And so he was an Italian designer. He set it all up, but he needed apprentices to do it. You go to Europe, you'll see more Titians than any other painter from the Renaissance. Why? Titian had about 500 guys painting, and he would go off and down the line for a little something there. It's Titian. Okay. <laughs> no, he did it with others, and he had to select those others very carefully. And they were his apprentices, and he did it together. The, the, the question, who animated, who, who's the animating genius besides Bambi, Snow White, et cetera, et cetera, everyone? <laughs> Walt Disney. Walt Disney and lots of other guys. Well, this he did the first Steamboat Willie, and he, he did the voice for Mickey all those years. And by the way, Steamboat Willie had five fingers. They had to change that to three because it looks creepy. And if you've seen Steamboat Willie, pretty creepy looking rat. It's not a cute Mickey at all. Um, but they drew those, and but he couldn't do it fast. It became a success. He hired nine guys. They do all the time because any place in the world, if there's a Disney shop here, we can go right out now and get a, an original uh, celluloid from Donald Duck, Daffy Goof, uh, Daffy Goof, the other. Um, we can uh, we'll do that because it took 130 of them for a minute. Not a computer. Those were all drawn. Am I this great thing to fame after World War II? He passed the Disney test for nine years. So it was Disney and these, this, this whole college of artists that created this world. And finally, what's pretty interesting here? The answer is always the same in America right away. Greatest, uh, most renowned uh, artist of the 20th century? Picasso. 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 And, uh, in some sense, you know, did he create that? By the way, it's even more pertinent you should know that because you know where he got his faces? Congolese and uh, Ashanti masks. He loved the masks of Africa and Congolese faces. 
many second places. But it was he and, and Barack. They lived together. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Uh, they were suffering as uh, as a, as Australian artists. They were impressionists. They lived together, and Barack went on to create another form of art, and he went on to create his. And there was their synergy between each other. What I want to argue is what Mark David Eisenhower said in his book, Present Europe. In the end, the success of D-Day wasn't a superior general or superior generals or years of careful planning. No, it was the superiority of numbers and supply. Rather, it was the initiative and leadership of countless individual GIs that won the battle for us. It was the courage of men who took charge of their situation they found themselves in and their private determination to prevail. You see the um, Saving Private Ryan, they're part of the beach. And if you remember the character, Tom Hanks' character, everybody remember what he was in, in real life? I suppose he was a joke. Anyone? Teacher. He was a teacher. He was a 30 year old high school teacher from a small town. He said, I can't tell these boys I'm a teacher. They won't follow a teacher at the battle. They just had me in class last year. That's 18 years old. I had to be a warrior. But they were caught in that beach with 50 caliber. They all said, Get out! Let's get off this beach or we're going to die! Collective leadership. Training them. But, but it is part of this difference that I think leadership is always uh, amongst others. What can I say in conclusion? I think excellent leaders are hard to find because I'm convinced that whether we like it or not, corporations perpetuate themselves both for the strengths and weaknesses, and corporate cultures tend to clone their own. Um, so you can see that in the Catholic Church in regards to the last two, I mean, the last two culture, friends, the last two soulmates, etc., etc. So they clone their own. You're not going to have a book down the 23rd of soon. <laughs> that you always perpetuate yourself. You look at it uh, for years and years and years. IBM, the four presidents of IBM in the last 10 years, he said the Italian chapter, his name is Skippy right now, was six or four. They all looked alike. They wore the same glasses. Uh, there's a reality to it. it. It's not the good old boy system that's only men about. We choose others like us as a natural phenomenon. It's hard to not take others like us. Corporations clone their own. That's why corporations say, it's the same place. I mean, I, it was just graduation, and I had to give out a certificate for the best the management student. And her name was Jessica, and I said, and uh, I just want to point out that uh, Jessica's parents met in my classroom in 1973. And I brought them up, and he said, you look the same way you did that. I said, you're a damn liar, but thank you. Um, you know, I said, you look the same way. No, I'm not. You just remember me the same way. But the reality is true is corporations keep repeating themselves. If it works, they keep repeating themselves. And we do, too. You, my, no, my daughter told said you said the same jokes. I said, I'm dating a little bit, but okay, do the same jokes. Okay? That's the wonderful thing about being a teacher. Same jokes every semester, new okay. ones. Uh, you got to listen to me all the way through. You're hate me for the other way. Um, but I am convinced that corporation, I mean, that's good there. Yeah. But we have to look at what is the corporation thinking about? What's going on here? I think, like it or not, business ethics is driven by moral leadership. The problem is, we just don't see moral leaders all that often. Um, uh, a play on words here is I think that very often, uh, uh, Justice Stewart can see person. I don't know what pornography is until I don't know where it is until I see it. We don't know what we mean by moral leadership to the actual CEO. And that's why we have to teach ethics by virtue of character and example and case, because there's no simple formula. Just do the following things, and you'll be a wonderful leader, and all this always work. But what I am convinced of, uh, ladies and gentlemen, is ethic, uh, ethical ideas, standards, and values can and may originate anywhere within an organization, unless it's paid for by the top, unless it's maintained by the top, unless it's substantiated by the top, it will fail. Let me end. Um, with two Greek quotes. Always end with a Greek quote. <laughs> if you can't say it in Greek, they think it would be <laughs> The old Greek proverb, a, a fish rots from its head first. And I think we find out about bad corporations not by, oh, that middle manager really made a mistake. <laughs> you know, we find out from the top as well. And I think also um, that um, there's this whole other issue of ambition that I want to talk about, but I think the ambition I'm talking about is what Thucydides is talking about. Those who really deserve praise are the people who, while human enough to enjoy power, nevertheless pay more attention to justice than they are compelled to by their situation. And they desire to be of service to others, not simply to be of others. Thank you very, very much.
But tell the truth for a couple bucks, but that's another story. <laughs> I just don't want to reflect on it. Who's perfect? Who can sustain prolonged criticism? Um, Mario Cuomo in America gave a speech at the convention. We all went, oh my God, we want him. No, he's got a little bit of a tainted head. Not he himself. Now, he's far enough away that his son may be far enough away from it. And clearly, he's now governor of the state of New York. And he's being set up to be to, to run in the next couple of years. He'd be far enough away from it. I think we find out everything about people right away. You know, everybody knew what was going on with, with, with uh, Steve Jobs. I didn't want to know. I mean, we've, seen, we've seen Ronald Reagan's lower intestine. We've seen Monica Lewinsky's blue dress. <laughs> Give too much information to some extent. But I think, here's the problem with We expect Jesus Christ. Nobody's perfect. A, 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 a woman leader that my graduate students always defend, and I'm going to blow her name from Pepsi, from Mexico. Um, Help me, name me a woman. Help me. I'm blowing her name. Anyone? Anyone? What's her name? It's Seosis. You've got a computer right there, you know, ready? Get on. That's <laughs> <laughs> Pepsi, Cola, and I forgot her name right now. She lives in a, she, she sleeps in a room next to her office. She doesn't talk to her oldest child. Her husband lives in another city, and if you disagree with her, you're fired. She's by no means perfect, but she, she's taken Pepsi and, and, and blended or trade her, and, and get, oh, it's, you got it? It's coming, it's coming. Slow computer, you can't depend on it. <laughs> anyway, and, and she's held up this, you know, Margaret Thatcher, which is what you can't remember. This, and, and we're all revering her. She scares the hell out of me, and she has, you know, everyone's got, who is perfect in their private life? And then who's perfect in every decision? But right now, because of the immediacy of things, you've got to be a winner every time you're at that. Well, in America, we have our favorite sport, supposedly, is baseball. And you're a major player if you're hitting the baseball and your average is 307, which means 3.7 times out of 10, you hit the ball. <laughs> and these guys are getting $190 a year. Yes, thanks. Of course, I knew that. See? Um, Indra Noya, N-O-O-Y-I, right? And she's beautiful, and she's, she's been the most, and, and according to people I know, the smartest person they've ever met. But a tyrant and a bully. And another one, you know? Uh, who, who was going to, you know, there used to be a thing for us. Who was the third the American candidate, the, the, the third candidate? Oh, uh, oh, not T. Boone's picking. Oh, Ali, help me. Um, the guy from General Motors. Um, who ran as the third candidate? Uh, two, two. No, not Rumpel. No, no, no. Um, Ross, Ross Pro. Ah! Ah! Come on in, get a pump coming. Then he fired you. <laughs> no, I don't know what Y'all come in. You got to pump me up. This is Russ Brooks. This is my wife's Russ Brooks. Y'all come in. Then he fired me. <laughs> but I think, and I talk about leadership more and more. I think my end chapter, and I started to write my end chapter on the plane here because, hi, I'm Al, and I'm an alcoholic. I'm a workaholic. I'm an alcoholic too, but I'm going to tell you. Only if I'm a workaholic, I have to relax some. But anyway, um, is, it, you can't expect the perfect leader. Everyone's going to be fail. And I think the exposure rate is so much faster. Who had the biggest paper firm in the whole world? I was in, I was in England two days ago, and what was on the front page of every English paper? Yeah. Murdoch is, is going down in flames. All right. Um, so I think that that's problematic. Is there a perfect leader? No. Is there an approximation? Perhaps. Perhaps. But I know that there's a huge discrepancy between what I want to call, uh, what Bonhoeffer called, the vera fior, the the misleader person who's really not interested in the organization but themselves. And he was talking about Adolf Hitler. And the day that Hitler was being inaugurated as chancellor, the only elected office ever won, Bonhoeffer, as a new minister with that radio, talking about that he's corrupting the fuel or principle, which is the leader. And, and Hitler wound up saying within two years, I'm Volk, I'm the Reich, I'm Führer. By the way, have you ever thought about it? Heil Hitler? Hail Hitler. It's like I said to my students, I want to do that. So when you come in, it's Hail Gene, both of us. <laughs> <laughs> Talk about somebody who mismanaged. Even the, 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 the papal we is supposed to mean, in all humility, um, we, the community. I speak for we. Um, so I think that one of the real phenomena of leadership is there ain't that many. I mean, perhaps that's the reason we revere 
people such as Lincoln. And, and I think you will revere, if you don't already, uh, uh, Nelson Mandela and, as, you, as your Lincoln. We revere, uh, interesting, we revere George Washington. But now historians are saying because he didn't screw it up and he could have. <laughs> he didn't screw the first president, he didn't screw it up. He really could have. But he really wasn't a great leader, you know, a great guy, you know, this, tall. That's what John Adams says, he's going to be a leader, he's tall. John Adams is Yeah, you know, so I don't know if I'm answering your question, but I think also the thing is, everything you do is right on the front page, right? Everything. What give you everything? Right? Go ahead. <laughs> increase in um, these exposing channels will force a change in social behavior as far as needs go. One hopes, but the other the other damn little thing is you'll get you'll give more good people less willing to serve for the exposure. And that's been the case I'm sorry, look at the candidates' presidency in the last twenty years in America. Huh? This is the best America. Look at the people who signed the Declaration of Independence in America, look at the people who run for the office now. You've got to be kidding me. <laughs> I, because why would you take this job? Why would you do this job? Why do I want this kind of aggravation? Et cetera, et cetera. Even Lyndon Baines Johnson, who coveted power, said this is too much. I think, you're, I, I think you will, hopefully the good is, only the best will go, and it'll all be wonderful. And, but I, I think that what you're going to do is more clever ways. I've learned one thing <laughs> in old days. If there's a way to be corrupt, we'll fit in. <laughs> Yes, sir, right over there. Uh, well, I want to know, so given that this Masters of the Universe um, urge that some people have, have got us into trouble so many times in the past, um, this emphasis on on waiting for now the, the good leader, is, um, isn't that perhaps misguided? I mean, because what happened in, in, in Gakobo in states is that over the last 150 years, we got rid of uh, personality cults lineages, kings, and uh, charismatic leaders with great uh, leadership skills, and we and the focus was building on building institutions. Yeah, yeah. We so the guy doesn't matter anymore. Um, so so why why does ethics require a leader and not? Well, because I think that theory is wrong. I think a person of character. I think you do need a charismatic leader. By charismatic, I mean a person who can communicate the message that they stand for. I mean, I'm really the person. I'm nice. No, no, I think that it should be an institution of laws rather than individuals. I totally agree with that. But a charismatic leader is, you don't say, you know, that's called the Continental Army. All right, gentlemen, we're going to take that hill. Uh, most of you want to come with me, don't you? Please. <laughs> <laughs> Those are, you stand back here with the walkie-talkie. I'll, uh, I'll be right back. I, no, I think you do need a charismatic I think you need good communicators. I mean, I want the Greek tradition. Get up. Make it, I want the Ciceronian tradition. You know, to stand up and state in a logical way what you're about, not these false debates that we have politically in America, which are just so hamstrung with limitations, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, posturing and image, et cetera. But I do think you never get away from person. We're human beings. We don't fall in love with droids. You know, and she, she's beautiful. She never speaks to me. I'm so sorry. She's tall. She's a good dancer. And she has no personality. She's perfect. <laughs> Not true at all, I'm sure, I'm sure. Your mother just phoned me before, and I know this. No, I think we need living, breathing human beings, but who are not so in love with themselves. And I have to tell you this about Barack. I don't, I don't know how you feel, fellow American. He's so under self serving. I don't feel that he's self serving. Do you? I really don't. I mean, I'm a card character Democrat, I, I admit it. But I, don't, I mean, he's not out there saying, you know, it's all about me, and let's talk about me, and what about me? I don't feel that. I don't feel that. Yes, sir, the gentleman right now. Do we know each other? Uh, no. No, you look so familiar. Maybe I want to know you. I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I can't be friends with you. Okay, good. <laughs> uh, and just what you have talked to us about and what you've been sharing, uh, I get a sense that when we talk about leadership, it's confined to position or title or some kind of elevated. Uh, is, is that am I understanding? Well, that's what I'm focusing on, but I think one has to be a leader of one's own life, one has to be a leader of one's own relationships. One doesn't usually associate leader with that, but I think 
to be a good parent, you have to have character, quality, virtue. Um, um, but yeah, I guess I'm talking about either inside organizational development. Yeah. It's going fine to organization. It's not, it, it, I, yeah, I'm limiting it right now, but I, I don't think being a person of integrity should only be, you know, I, on the job, I'm totally, I, I have total integrity. Off the job, I'll steal anything from you at all. No, I don't, I don't think that's the case. By the way, that's why Mr. Clinton should have stepped down. The sex was sex, but it was also stupid. There, there are a thousand women in Washington, I'm sure, would have gladly abandoned him and never said a word. You know, and there's somebody called right there called my friend. You blew the pooch. That's a term from Vietnam. You blew it. Walk away. You're an embarrassment. I mean, said that, we all were making a lot of money. And just we didn't want to <laughs> Yeah, I think it's my turn. Yes, sir. Last question. Last question. At what point do you s try to influence lack of leadership? Or do you consistently try? And at what point do you give up and move on? Within a work environment. So if you, oh, rec that, uh, if you recognize and understand that there is a lack of yeah. leadership in that space and you're being driven down a wrong path, and you continue to increase your sphere of influence to try and redirect that. Is there a point that's in time where you make question. a decision that I says... To, I hate to end on a question I can't answer, and I can't, except there's an old book a long time ago. It was critique, uh, debate, critique, or exit. I think those are your three options, ultimately, in an organization. You're working for a bad leader. Here's, here's the comments. Stand the stuff and success is connected to our job. You're making a lot of money. You don't like the leader. You like where it's going. You try to change it, but are you going to give up that job? Are you going to give up that money? You've got two kids in school. You've got to get a mortgage <coughs> larger than mine. Um, and you've got two cars in the driveway. You're hamstrung. But I do think the, uh, uh, good leadership comes from good, is connected to good followership. Good followership has to be, I won't do this. I won't vote for you. I won't, I won't give you my proxy by saying that. And you give persons proxy by saying nothing. But after a while in an organization, to be brutally f uh, fair with you, Molly and I don't like the president of our schools. We don't like the president of Georgetown. Well, we can complain. We have a students, we have a faculty senate, um, uh, so on and so forth. But after a while, it's go along or go away. And I think that's uh, unfortunately the case. I think it's unfortunate. But you know, um, leaders do get the post now in very real ways. And again, because of the electronic media. And I use this as an example of that, and I want to defend that. Think of this last summer. Think of starting with Egypt. That was all that beautiful book, whose name I can't remember right now. That was all the, the virtue of texting, the virtue of social connection. Changed the world. At least changed the world. But I don't know how to answer that. I hate to answer that way, uh, but I guess you have to the way. And I want to thank you for not throwing anything at me, but because I'm a fellow citizen, I appreciate it even more. Thank you very much.